All right, Julie Duron, Paris 2024 Olympic triathlon silver medalist. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it feels a bit unreal still. <laughs> Literally feels unreal, like no, the, the, the weight it, of it around the, the weight. The, neck. the weight feels real. It's quite heavy, heavier than probably most people would think. But um, yeah, to have this one and to keep it, it's yeah, pretty special. Was that the moment when the understanding of what you'd achieved really sunk in, put around your neck, and you were able to say, take a breath and realize what you'd done? I mean, since the race, it's just been a whirlwind. So whenever I get a quiet moment or when I was swimming yesterday, there's just moments where it hits me and I'm like, wow, this really just happened. So it's pretty, it's pretty special. And till I feel like fully believe it, I think it's going to take a few more weeks, definitely. Yeah. But safe to say Wednesday, the 31st of July was the greatest day of your life so far. Yeah, the greatest day of my career for sure. I mean, I have pretty much the perfect race that I could have and to have it all come together on the most important day it's yeah it's incredible I mean we work so hard and to have it pay off like this it's yeah really special yeah. really nice uh, what a time to put together the race of your career yeah for sure I mean we've prepared really really well like mentally physically I knew I was ready and then you need some certain luck during the race as well so to have that happen it's yeah it's really really nice so i guess a word about all that hard work and at what point did it all start to zoom in the focus on project paris and just how hard has that work been is it that are they the toughest sessions you've ever put yourself through <laughs> Yeah, I had some pretty tough sessions in the lead up, uh, some, some of Nicholas Burke's session. And when I, when I managed to finish those sessions, it just was an incredible feeling that I, I had reached the level that she was at. So that gave me a lot of confidence before Paris. And I mean, yeah, the focus on Paris has been for, for several years now. After, after Tokyo, I had a lot of discussions with my coach. Um, where, where I was going to go from, from there. I missed out on Tokyo. I knew then I wasn't good enough to be selected for the team. It was, it was obvious. And he said, oh, do you really want to go for another cycle? And yeah, I had to have a lot of talks to myself. And I decided, no, that's my dream. I, I, I really want to go for it. And I want to invest and try to make the next team. And yeah, already when I got selected, I knew I, I had made everything like I I did everything I could to make sure I was on that team that there was no question whether I was gonna go it was it was certain that I was yeah the best Swiss athlete at that time to be selected so there was no not gonna be a way around me so I was already super pleased to be selected and then to come away with a medal is just the icing on the cake as you would say the, uh, yeah, the Spirig sessions then, is there, is there an underlying philosophy behind it all? Something that you keep having to come back to that it's all built upon? Yeah, I mean, we, we worked a lot on just being super fit here, like physically. And then mm. I did um, what Nicola did before her, her gold medal in London was that she did two half Ironman distance races in, in the lead up. And that's what I followed. So I followed her plan. I did... I ran 70.3 rappers wheel in um, at the beginning of June and then at the end of June I did another half Ironman race in, in uh, Austria and those just gave me a lot of strength, they gave me a lot of endurance and they also gave me confidence that I would not blow up in the end. So that's why I, I when I set out on the run I was like, you can do it. I mean it's only 10k, get into your rhythm, stay there for as long as you can. Um, and then when we got onto the last lap, um, I've been doing a lot of 800s in, in training. So I said to myself, you can hold on for another three 800s. You can do it. You can keep this pace going. And yeah, just uh, I think in the, at the finish line, just the realization that all the hours of training and yeah, the ups and the downs and the crying in sessions and the, the elation of having like good races in the lead up, um, yeah, was all leading to this moment. 
so yeah, that yeah, there's a lot of sacrifice that's gone into it, and I know you've dedicated the medal in part to your family as well. So yeah, presumably there's been long periods where you've not been able to see them, not really been in contact, and where there's just a sort of disconnect in the reality of what you've been doing and what they're up to and it's just... yeah yeah for sure I mean at the, for example at the beginning of this year I spent four months in China training and um, I love Switzerland I love my home so to be away for this long is not always easy I, I had a great time training there but it's it's not the same as being home so yeah for also my family to accept that I'm away and to support my decisions and to also in the lead up in the last couple of months they they've taken over so much to look after me like I when I was alone for a weekend in St. Moritz my mom came up especially so I wouldn't be alone um, so just to have their support and yeah them being here also it was was very nice to have them see me execute the best race I could that was really really special and also yeah, I made them pretty emotional. <laughs> yeah, who held it together the least <laughs> of you and The least mom. <laughs> my mom. So, yeah, I, I got to call them. I didn't see them for quite a long time after the race, but I called my mom and she was, yeah, she had a pretty teary voice. And I told her, oh, stop crying, you're making me cry again as well. So, yeah, all, all pretty emotional, yeah. And you, how did you celebrate, presumably, like, there's all of that and there's the admin side of it with the you know doping control and stuff afterwards and then that first moment where you're just actually like alone whether it's you've gone back to the hotel room mm -hmm. and you're unpacking or whatever and like, yeah. I just always think yeah, there must be that bit where you're just I don't know sat on the edge of your bed yeah and there's nothing else really going on suddenly it's all gone a bit quiet yeah yeah I mean I on race day I got up at four o'clock and I felt like from there on it was just like one thing after the other especially after the race which is all very nice but it's always like and I, I also I also didn't quite prepare for what happened after I got the medal so I was like someone has to tell me where I have to go because I don't know where I have to go. Just let me know and I will follow you. Like, okay, now doping. Okay, then press conference, next thing. And then we went to the broadcasting center to do the, all the interviews with the Swiss media. So I just had to, I, I was lucky enough to have someone telling me where I had to go. Otherwise I would have been completely lost. And then we actually got to the hotel at like 11.30 or something. and. I, it was the first moment I was alone all day, so I was like, yeah. it's quiet. And then, yeah, as you said, you, you're there and you're just like, really? This medal is like mine now? What, what's happening? But then I was also super tired, so <laughs> I actually, I, I, I crashed. I went to bed quite tired and I could actually sleep. Slept a good sleep. Yeah, I did so. Yeah. Was that just on the bedside table? Or <laughs> where did it, you know? Yeah, because we haven't gotten a box yet, so I'm still waiting to get a nice box to put this one in. Yeah. So I put it away safely in a sock and put it in the closet. But um, the yeah, Louis Vuitton I, box. Yeah, uh, apparently I don't know. I haven't gotten it it's yet. It's gonna be almost as nice as the actual thing. Is it really? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I can imagine Hopefully, they're not gonna we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there something nice? to be said for going into the race a little bit under the radar. All the talk really was about Cassandra and, and Beth and yeah. maybe Flora and so on, but there's a lot to be said for not going into the biggest race as a favorite. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I was super impressed of how Cassandra managed to, yeah, cope with everything, that she managed to hold it together mentally. That was really impressive. And also Beth, I mean, those two had a lot of pressure on them and I knew I didn't have any pressure on myself. I think that probably also surprised a lot of people that I, when I was running at the front, maybe it also surprised the other athletes. And yeah, I mean, we, we did have some media beforehand, but nothing compared to if I were going into as a favorite and also mentally for me to prepare and just say, I have nothing to lose. I can just go there and try my very best and no one's expecting anything of me. Of course, you, put all, you always put pressure on yourself, but I didn't really feel a lot of pressure from outside, which was a nice feeling. And also something I discussed with my coach a lot is, yeah, 
what's there to lose? You know, your family is gonna still love you after the race. So, in most cases, I don't know in, with other people, but in my <laughs> case, I know that they will still love me even if I have a bad race, and especially then they will be there to pick me up and put me back together. So, mm. to just, yeah, try and go into the race as calm as possible and just execute and focus on the next 10 meters in front of you. Was part of the you know, you led that race, quite a lot of that race. Yeah. Was that there... wasn't the plan. <laughs> <laughs> right. I wondered if on the run, there was an idea of just wanting to not give control over to either Beth or Cassandra, mm -hmm. who have been kind of renowned as the, yeah. the two runners to watch. And a feeling like if you were pushing the, you know, maybe as soon as they started to feel too comfortable in familiar surrounds, you know, you've won some great big races for sure, but somewhat less yeah. familiar surrounds. Yeah. No, for me, it was always the plan that obviously I had to have a good swim to be as close as possible to the front group. I did that. I was really pleased with that and then get to the front of the bike, um, stay there, stay safe, especially in those conditions. And then we always said, I'm fit. I can r run a good pace for 10K. So I, I was always wanting to get into T2 and out of T2 in a really good position and then just see what happens and try to stay with the front pack. If someone's coming past me, try to hook on and just stay there, get into my rhythm. You always feel bad when you step off the bike and start running. So just get through that mm. discomfort at the beginning of the run and then just see how long I can hold on to the good runners, you know. But also, you came out of T2 first. That must have, mm -hmm. that's got to be that, that an initial little boost from Yeah, from that, that was, alone, that right? was a, I knew that I was in the position I wanted to be in. Yeah. And then I, yeah, I told myself, just wait till they come past you. And then, yeah, hook on. And no one coming past me is like, what's happening? But mm -hmm. actually, I do quite a bit of training, especially on the run by myself. So I actually like to run at the front. I, it's scary. It was very scary to run with three other girls and know there's only going to be uh, three medals to go. Um, but it, that's where I felt comfortable and I just got into my rhythm. I had my pace and I kept thinking, when are they going to come past? It's, it, it can't be possible that the pace that feels good for me is good enough for them. You know, I always expected their pace to be higher than my pace. Um, and then, I, yeah, I was a bit surprised when that wasn't the case, but uh, probably it's just that I haven't gotten used to my level yet. That I, because I, I, I know that I improved my run level a lot since last year, and I haven't mentally connected to that improvement yet, probably. Were you able to enjoy any of that run? On the bike, you looked like you were having a great time. You were smiling, <laughs> you were off the front, like it was a proper grin on yeah. for some of that. On the run, you, was there any sense of what was going around? Or was it just, you could just hear the footsteps of the three other athletes and... Yeah, you couldn't hear the footsteps. You could only hear the cheering. The, right. It was so much noise and it was incredible. I mean, yeah. the atmosphere was crazy. Um, yeah, as you said, on the bike, I had a few moments where I was like, you're leading or you're in the lead pack of the Olympic Games. It's incredible. Just try to soak it in and, you know, um, probably you've heard of Kipchoge who tries to smile to give him extra energy and I uh -huh. sort of um, discovered this for myself this year and it, gave, like, it, it works, it gives you a lot of energy so if you try and smile from time to time during the race if you can remember it really helps and then on the run I was just re very focused really yeah. And the belief just kept building, I guess, the closer and closer that got yeah, to the line. Yeah, I, I mean, I had my ups and downs also during the run. There goes a lot of, on in your mind. I had moments where I thought, oh, I'm going to get forced today. But then I, I had to reel myself back and tell myself, no, you can't already decide the outcome of the race during the race. You have to fight for every position. And then, yeah, after halfway of the run, I I had the feeling I was going to get a medal that day or I was going to die trying. and. Um, yeah, I'm so pleased it worked out like that. Were you trying some moves through there of your own? Was it fairly consistent and that was sort of the point that your pace was what you were feeling 
so good with? And yeah, the plan was to settle into a good pace for the first half and then try to ramp it up in the mm. second half of the run. When we got on to the last lap, I saw my coach on the side and he made some movement. I don't even know what he did, but I interpreted it as, you have to go now. So I tried <laughs> to go then <laughs> and uh, yeah, put some more pressure on and just try to, yeah, as I said, build the pace. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, yeah, a word for Cassandra and that final move she made that she yeah. also made look incredibly easy. Yeah. If you're going to finish second to someone, then <laughs> at least make it like the home sort yeah. of brand new legend of, of French sport as well. Yeah, in for a way. sure. Um, I mean, I was prepared that there was going to come an attack. I watched the race from last year back. I knew where Beth attacked last year, so I was prepared for an attack at some point. Um, and when Cassandra came around, yeah, I couldn't respond. So it was impressive how she could notch it up and yeah, or take it up another notch and just accelerate away. Uh, yeah, I mean, after her initial uh, like acceleration, the, the gap didn't open up that much more, but it was just too much at that moment. So it was really impressive and I'm super happy for her as well. It was, yeah, incredible to see. and. I mean, I know that most of the people were cheering for the French, but it was just really nice also to run with them because then I got all the cheers as well. <laughs> <laughs> and the whirlwind continued, then it was suddenly the men's race going on and mm -hmm. there's like, you know, all that to, to contend with in the background yeah. while you were trying yeah, to get Yeah, unfortunately, with unfortunately, I didn't really get to see the men's race because I was, yeah, going around talking to the mm. media and all that. But I mean, the men's race, looked incredible as well and they yeah they had the challenge of the heat we had the challenge of the wet roads and they had the challenge of the heat so i think it was a great day for triathlon for sure yeah as you were going through the bike i mean there must have been the the moments the patches on the road the areas and there were you know laura lindemann for example came mm -hmm. off who was one of the pre-race favorites as yeah. well like those that, that that level of concentration that you needed to maintain yeah. on top of everything else was was red red hot. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I knew I had to stay safe on the bike. We discussed before the race with my coach how I was going to approach it. I know that I'm technically really good on the bike, so I was confident that I, yeah, I was not going to crash. But you never know when something can happen so quickly. So it's very unfortunate that so many girls crashed out. It's yeah, it was probably really hard to see. My sisters were on the turn where you turn off the Champs-Élysées and they said it was a terrible spot to be because there's, that's the point where so many crashes happened. And yeah, yeah it was, I hope that everyone is okay. From what I heard, everyone recovered more or less fine. So yeah, it was definitely really challenging conditions. Was there ever a moment where you thought Flora was going to get away here again. She was going to do a Bermuda and we're not going to see her until the finish line. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I had to catch up to the front pack first and then uh, only then I realized that Flora was up the front as well. It's yeah. like, oh, that would be gutsy if she was going to go for, for it by herself for mm. 40K. Um, I think the group, when I caught them, they were like confident that we were going to be able to catch Flora. But I mean, she was really aggressive on the bike as well attacking and attacking so you always had to be careful and you know when flora attacks you just have to cover her move because she's so strong yeah, yeah. and you must have had to be hell for leather out of t1 to sort of bridge that out. how was that that yeah. opening lap and just sort of how yeah. it all eventually merged into what was kind of the ideal group to, to do that and to, mm -hmm. to catch flora yeah i mean i was yeah the, the swim was so hard for me i knew it was going to be crucial and that was hanging off the back for dear life and just try to stay as close in contact to the back of the front group as I could. And I was confident that at the beginning of the bike, I was going to be strong enough to bridge up. Obviously, you never know if it really is going to work out. I think I was lucky that the conditions were tricky, so the front group couldn't go as all out as in other races if it were dry. So I think that played into my favor. and. Yeah, I was very determined out of T1 to get into the group with, because I knew that was going to be my race. If, if I made it, I, I knew I was going to be in the perfect position. Yeah, and fueled somewhat by the just sheer delight of being out of that water and out of that current. Uh, you know, you're 
unlikely to ever really do many swims like that ever again. No, that was, that was really challenging. I mean, yeah, the current was so strong. And for me, I knew that I just had to get into the feet of someone in front of me, of some swimmer in front of me, because that was going to save me a lot of energy and also drag me off the river. And that was, yeah, for me, really, I think that the swim played into my favor. And it's, at the end of the day, silver medal in what will undoubtedly go down as one of the most iconic triathlon <laughs> races of all time. Yeah. I mean, you were part of history, right? Yeah, it's, it's crazy to think about it like this. Um, yeah, it it's just makes me incredibly proud and also that I was, pl was playing such a big role in the race. Yeah, it's just really, really special. Brilliant. Well, well Thank done. You. Thanks. Thank you so much.